so I'm Miss Jo. I'm one of the new services librarians here. And I'm very excited to have Mrs. Rice back. Mrs. Rice was a teacher uh, in the Liverpool School District for many years. And she was a reading specialist. And she also led the storytelling camp, which or, what was it? Club? It was a club when we were at LA. Yeah. It was a club. And then we brought her here to the library. We've done three storytelling camps here at the library. And we will be doing another one this summer. So if you like the story that you did and you're interested in, in doing some yourself, or you just want to hear more stories by her and not perform, look for her um, sign up in the summer. She'll be doing another week long camp for us. Uh, <laughs> All right, so I'd like to introduce Mrs. Rice, and she's going to tell us some exciting Irish stories. Hi, how are you? Um, I thought because it's March, we really should talk about the weather. You know what they say about March? What did they say about March? It comes in like a lion and goes out like a lamb. So I thought we'd start with a snow time story. And some of you who were here not long ago know this story with me. It's Thomas' snowsuit. And your job is this. Take out your fingers. And this is the sign language sign for no. No, 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 no. But you've got to get louder with each no. Can you try that with me? No, 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 no. no. OK? So when we start the nose, you're going to help me with it. The title of the story is Thomas' Snowsuit by Robert Munch. One day, Robert's mother went out to the store to buy Robert a brand new brown snowsuit. She brought it home, and Robert took one, Thomas took one look at that snowsuit, and he said, if you think I'm wearing that snowsuit, you're crazy. And his mother said, well, we'll just see about that. So the next morning, Thomas's mother took out the snowsuit. And she said, Thomas, time for school. Put on your snowsuit. And Robert, Thomas said, no, 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 no. Thomas, said his mother, put on your snowsuit. And Thomas said, no, 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 no. no, no. So Mother picked up Thomas in one hand. She picked up the snowsuit in the other, and she tried to stick them together. They had an enormous fight. And when they were done, Thomas was in a snowsuit. So Mother took Thomas to school. And as soon as they got to school, Thomas pulled off the snowsuit, hung it in the coat closet, and ran to the seat. Well, when recess time came, Thomas's teacher said, all right, boys and girls, Put on your snowsuits, and every kid in the class put on their snowsuit and ran out the door for recess. Everyone except Thomas. And she said, Thomas, put on your snowsuit. And what did Thomas say? No, 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 no. Thomas said his teacher, put on your snowsuit. And Thomas said, no, 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 no. So the teacher picked up Thomas in one hand. She picked up the snowsuit in the other, and she tried to stick them together. They had an enormous fight. And when they were done, Thomas was in his underwear, and the teacher was wearing Thomas's snowsuit. <laughs> Just then, the principal walked in. What is the meaning of this? He said, it's Thomas, said the teacher. He will not put on his snowsuit. So the principal said, Thomas, put on your snowsuit. And Thomas said, no, 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 no. Thomas, said the principal, do it now. Put on your snowsuit. And Thomas said, no, 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 no. So the principal picked up Thomas in one hand and the teacher in the other. And he put them together and they had an enormous fight. And when they were done, Thomas's snowsuit, and the teacher's dress were in a great big ball on the floor, and Thomas was still in his underwear, and the teacher was still in her underwear. Oh. And so then, from outside, they heard all the kids yell, Thomas, 
come out and play. And Thomas ran right to the coat room, jumped in the snowsuit, and shook off. While the principal took one look at the teacher in her underwear and said, put on your dress. Well, she said, first you have to put on Thomas's snowsuit. Oh, no, said the Thomas, said the principal. So the principal picked up the teacher, and the teacher picked up the snowsuit, and they had an enormous fight. And when they were done, the principal was wearing the teacher's dress, the teacher was wearing Thomas's snowsuit, and they were still not in their clothes. Well, they began to argue. You take off that first. No, you take off that first. And they argued, and they argued. And they argued until Thomas came in from recess. He took one look at the principal and another look at the teacher. He picked up the principal in one hand and the teacher in the other hand, and he tried to stick them together. There was an enormous fight. And when they were done, everybody was back in their own clothes. And the next day, the principal moved to Arizona, where nobody ever has to wear a suit. The end. So this next story is brand new. I wrote it on Saturday. So I might not have everything perfectly smoothly, but that's okay because you guys are used to helping me with all of that, right? Well, it's based on a story that you may have heard before. And it's also going to remind you of a story that I tell during Halloween time. Do you know that story, Big Pumpkin? Yeah. Okay, well this will remind you of Big Pumpkin, but it's a springtime story because March comes in like a lion but goes out like a lamb, which means spring starts in the middle of March and the weather gets nice and warm. And what do we do when the weather gets warmer? Um, we play in the pool because that's my favorite thing to do when the well, I don't think it's quite warm enough in March. What is something else that people like to do outside in the dirt in March? Plant. They love to plant things. So, this story is actually inspired by my grandchildren. But it's also a little bit of a folktale that I've heard before. And it's called The Great Big Enormous Turnip. And it stars Baba, which is what my grandchildren call their grandfather, and Nana, which is what our grandchildren call me. And I might need some helpers for this story, so sit right where you are. And when I need you, I'm going to call you up. And will you promise to be really understanding? Because this is the world premiere of this story. I have never told it before, except at home to Mr. Rice. So hopefully, you will help me get through it, okay? The Great Big Enormous Turnip by Mrs. Rice. Retold by Mrs. Rice, because it is a folk tale. It was early in spring, and Baba was ready to plant his garden. And so he went out because roasted, barbecued, boiled, or stewed turnips were Baba's favorite food. So he planted an entire garden full of turnips. And he watered them, and he weeded them, and he watched them grow. And by late spring, Papa knew that those turnips were ready. Because you know, roasted, barbecued, boiled, or stewed, turnips were Papa's favorite food. So Papa went out to the garden ready to pull all of those turnips when what did he see? The rabbits had eaten every single turnip except for one. One teeny, tiny, runty, little turnip. Oh no, said Papa. Oh no, the rabbits have eaten all of my turnips. And roasted, barbecued, boiled, and stewed turnips are my favorite. Mm. Nana, so Nana came running. And he said, Nana, Nana, look at my garden. And Nana said, don't worry, Papa. Don't worry, Papa. We can fix this. We can fix this. If we take good care. If we take good care. Of that one teeny tiny runty little turnip. Of that one teeny tiny runty little turnip. Maybe it will grow. Maybe it will grow. 
Well, if you say so, Nana, because you know roasted, barbecue, boiled, or stew, turnips are my favorite food. And Nana said, I know, Papa. So they went and they watered that teeny tiny runty little turnip. And they weeded it. And they talked to it. Roasted, barbecue, boiled, or stew. Turnips are Papa's favorite food. And that night, they went in the house, ate their dinner, and they went to sleep. But in the middle of the night, Nana got up out of her bed. She tiptoed out to the garden, and she put her hands lovingly around that teeny, tiny, runty little turnip. And she said, roasted, barbecue, boiled, or stewed. Turnips are Papa's favorite food. Roasted, barbecue, boiled, or stewed. Turnips are Papa's favorite food. Please grow, little turnip. Please grow, little turnip. And she kissed that turnip, and she tiptoed back into the house. Well, the next morning, Papa went out to the garden, and he couldn't believe his eyes. That teeny, tiny, runty little turnip had grown hugely. And Papa, he wrapped his arms around that turnip, and he said, hee ho, hee ho, turnip roots, now please let go. Help me with that. Hee ho, hee ho, turnip roots, now please let go. But that turnip just sat. Nana, come and don't be slow. These turnip roots just won't let go. And Nana came running. And they both grabbed onto the turnip. And they said, heave ho, heave ho. Turnip roots, now please let go. But that great big enormous turnip just sat. So Nana called out, son, son. Son, son. Now don't be slow. Don't be slow. These turnip roots. These turnip roots. Just won't let go. Just won't let go. So the son came running. And they all grabbed hold of the turnip. And what did they say? Heave ho, heave ho. Turnip roots, now please let go. But that turnip just sat. So the son hollered, sister, sister. Sister, sister. Come, please come slow. Please come slow. Don't come slow. Don't come slow. These turnip roots. These two turnip roots. Just won't let go. Just won't let go. And sister, she came running. And they all grabbed onto that turnip. And they said, heave ho, heave ho. Turnip roots just won't let go. They pulled that turnip just sat. So sister said, Dog, 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 don't be slow. Don't be slow. These turnip roots, These turnip roots just, won't let go. just won't let go. And the dog came running. And the dog grabbed hold, and all of them grabbed hold, and they said, He ho, he ho, this turnip roots just won't let go. But that turnip just sat, and they were all very sad. So the dog started to bark. Then he ran around the barn, and when he came back, he had all of the rabbit family. Let's go. Anybody else who wants to come up? Come on. Oh, come on. Come on. The rest of the rabbit family came up. <laughs> And Papa said, great, okay, I'm going to hold on to the turnip. Nana, you hold on to me. Son, you hold on to Nana. Sister, you hold on to the son. Dog, you hold on to sister. And all of the rabbits, hold on. And all of you can help me. Heave, ho, heave, ho. Turnip roots, now please let go. Heave, ho, heave, ho. Turnip roots, now please let go. Heave, ho, heave, ho. Third time is the charm. So that turnip went pulling up and said, everyone flying. Fall down. Well. Hooray for the rabbit! And everyone got up. And the turnip went, help me here, bump them, bump them, bump them, bump them, bump them. Goes down the path, right to Nana and Baba's house. Hooray, everybody called. Hooray! And Baba and Nana went in the house and made a feast for everyone. Roasted, boiled, barbecue.
barbecued stew, turnips are Baba's favorite food, and they made it for everyone, including the rabbit family. And everyone ate, and when they were done, they all went home. And Baba said, roasted, barbecued, boiled in stew, I guess turnips are everyone's favorite Food. Nice job. If you were a helper, stand up. Let's clap for these people. I have one more springtime story for you that I'm going to tell that I haven't told in a really long time. But it's about a bunch of frogs. Why would I tell a frog story in the springtime? Frogs? Oh, yeah. Sure, frogs come out in the spring. Actually, frogs um, have their eggs, and then they become tadpoles, and then the tadpoles grow into frogs. Okay, so this is called the Turkey Goblin Frog Jump Show, and it's by Janet Slater Redhead. Miss Henrietta Hilda had a frog she called Matilda. And she said, my frog Matilda is far better than the rest. She's the greatest. She's the greenest. She's the cleverest and cleanest. And I know that she's the best at jumping like no other. King, King. Sir Braggy Bottom Betty had a frog he called Spaghetti. And he said, my frog spaghetti is far better than the rest. He's the greatest, he's the greenest, he's the cleverest and cleanest, and at jumping my spaghetti is far better than the rest. Queen Charlotte Pudding Clara had a frog called Darling Sarah. And she said, oh, my darling Sarah is far better than the rest. She's the greatest. She's the greenest. She's the cleverest and cleanest. And jumping darling Sarah is undoubtedly the best. His Majesty King Ronald had a frog he called McDonald. And he said, my frog McDonald is far better than the rest. He's the greatest. He's the greenest. He's the cleverest and cleanest. And in jumping, my McDonald is undoubtedly the best. Well, the mayor of Turkey Goblin heard the boasting and squabbling. And he said, let's have a frog show to decide whose frog is best, who's his greatest, who's his greenest, who's his cleverest and cleanest. And to find which jumps the highest, we will hold a jumping test. Well, a little boy with freckles had a little frog called Speckles. And he said, could my Speckles enter along with all the rest? He's not greatest. He's not greenest. He's not cleverest or cleanest. But I know he would enjoy it if you let him do the test. All the people shouted, Nega! But the mayor was fair and clever. And he said, why are you worried? If you're sure your frogs are best, if they're greatest, if they're greenest, if they're cleverest and cleanest, then why not allow another to compete against the rest? Well, the little boy with freckles was allowed to enter speckles, and he said, you could have fun and do your best. You're my greatest. You're my greenest. You're my cleverest and cleanest, and I'll always love you better than I ever could the rest. Oh, when Speckles heard his master, all at once his heart beat faster. For you see, a boy with freckles thought him better than the rest. He felt greatest, he felt greenest, he felt cleverest and cleanest, so he put his best foot forward and jumped better than his best. While the people stood and waited, while the mayor deliberated. Then he said, each frog's a winner, each is better than the rest. Matilda is the greatest, 
Spaghetti is the greenest. Sarah is most clever. McDonald is the cleanest. But a jumping little speckles is undoubtedly the best. Why do you think speckles was the best? Because he had hope. Because he had hope and because his master believed in him. The end. So now I would like to tell you an Irish story, and it's called Maeve and the Leprechaun. But first I want to ask you, what do you know about leprechauns? What do you know about leprechauns? You're scared of them? Okay, I'll take that. What do you know about leprechauns? They like money. They like money, specifically gold. What else? They're small. What else? You might see them more often on St. Patrick's Day. Anything else? Well, yes, Harper? They live under rainbows. I don't know if they live under there, but that's certainly where they bury their gold at the end of the rainbow. Yes? They wear green clothes. There's one on the cover of the Lucky Charms box. There you go. There's one on the cover of the Lucky Charms box. Well, you know what else is true about leprechauns is they can't tell lies if you caught them. They have to tell you the truth. And another thing is, if you catch one, what do you know? If you catch one, you will get a wish. And what do most people wish for? Money. Money or gold. Okay. And I bought this book when I was in Ireland. Oh, what do you think, Mr. Rice, 26 years ago? Like that. The first time we went to Ireland as a group, and it's called May and the Leprechaun. There was once a woman named May, and she was a no nonsense kind of girl. For you see, every time in the winter, when they would sit around and tell stories and sing songs just to pass the time, May would sit there with her arms crossed like this. For you see, May did not believe that there were leprechauns, or fairies, or anything of the sort, for she had never seen one. So every time someone would tell a story about one of them, Meg would laugh and say, oh, there's no such thing as leprechauns and fairies. So one summer day, Meg was sitting right by the bank of a beautiful river, and she was listening to the birds chirping and the bees humming, and she was all for just sitting there relaxing. And suddenly, she heard a sound. Tap, 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 tap. What is that sound, thought me? And she got up, and she looked down into the bushes, and there before her was a wee little man. He was wearing dark trousers, and a green coat, and, and a little green hat, and he had a little hammer. And he was sitting on a mushroom, hammering on a shoe. And around about him were teeny tiny little shoes, little fairy ones, and little ones with buckles, and little tiny boots. Oh, said Pig to herself, this must be a leprechaun. And she sneaked up, and she grabbed him out the wrist, and she said, I've got you. Oh, said the little man, who do you think you are? Oh, said me, well, I know. I've caught me a leprechaun, and you must show me your gold. Well, I don't want to, said the little man. I know, said May, but you also can't lie to me, so you must take me to your gold. I know, I know, said the leprechaun. So, as May grabbed him by the wrist, they went on down the river to this bank of bushes, and the leprechaun said, you're going to have to look into those bushes to find me gold. But Maeve knew she could not let go of that little man. And she could not take her eyes off that little man. So she dragged him out of the And she reached into the bushes. And she reached. And she reached. And she reached. Until finally. She had put her hand upon a beehive, and as she danced around trying to get away from the thing, she let go of the little man, and he 
vanished. Along with all of the gold that he'd had. Poor Maeve. There she was with a handful of bee stings and no gold. Can I tell you that come that winter, when everyone was telling their stories, Maeve would tell that story, but she would never let on that it happened to her. She would say it happened to that snowy old Patty Nolan, or that nasty little Colleen Farrell from the town on over. She never told them that it happened to herself. But from that day on, Maeve never said that she didn't believe in leprechauns. The end. Thanks. Okay. So this next story here is is maybe a little more for the adults, but that's okay. I think we can still all really enjoy a story about a lawyer. In Irish stories, there are lots of stories about people trying to trick the devil, and this is one of them. And this one does not have an author. It really is called a modern Irish folk tale. There was a man, and he had three sons. And he was very poor. For years he tried to make money, but he didn't have enough to send his sons to school. So finally, he decided he would make a deal with the devil. So he called the devil to him and he said, Devil, if you will give me enough money to send my sons to school, then I promise you may have my soul. I says the devil, that's a good bargain. And he went away. And he gave the man enough money to send his three boys to school. And one became a doctor, and one became a priest, and one became a lawyer. And so some years passed, and when the boys were out of school, the devil came back and he said to the man, it is time for you to give me your soul. And suddenly, the priest spoke up, and he began to pray, oh, son. I am so sorry, but I'm a terrible priest. In fact, I'm probably responsible for more souls going to you than to the Lord above. Please, won't you grant me, my father, just seven more years of life? And the devil thought about it, and he thought, hmm, in seven years, I could get to be a lot more souls with this terrible excuse for a priest. I, says the devil, and so it was agreed. And seven years passed. And then the devil comes back to ask the man for his soul. And who should speak up this time but the doctor? And the doctor says, oh, sir, I'm a terrible doctor. As a matter of fact, I'm probably responsible for more souls going out of this world than staying in it. Won't you grant me, Father, seven more years of life? And the devil thought about it. How many souls he could have if that doctor Practicing. And he agreed. But as it always happens, time passed, and seven more years went by. And now the devil was sure and certain that he would be able to take that soul of the old man. So he came to see him, and this time the man's son, the lawyer, spoke up. And he said, Oh, sir, you have been very generous. You have granted my, my father all of these extra years of life. So I'll not be asking much. But I was wondering, do you think you see that little bit of a candle over there? I says the devil. And, and do you see there's not much of it left? I says the devil. Well, says the sun, you see it shining brightly there. Could I just visit with me father just long enough for that candle to burn down and melt completely? And the devil looked at the tiny little butt of candle there, and he thought to himself, well, that's not much to ask. Aye, he says, and so it was agreed, but just then, the lawyer picked up the candle, blew out the flame, and put the candle in his pocket. For you see, the devil couldn't collect the soul for as long as that candle had not melted out. Trust a lawyer to beat the butt of the devil. The end. And my next story is actually one that maybe you've heard. There's a children's book called Clever Tom and the Leprechaun. Okay, and this is very similar. This is called The Crack of Gold. 
and it's written by Yvonne Carroll, the same lady who wrote that whole book of leprechaun tales that I had been telling you about. And so I'll tell you the crack of gold. It was a cold, moonlit night, and clever Tom had to walk home from the public home guilty. So he wrapped his scarf warm around his neck, and he began to walk on home. And as he walked, he heard in the bushes a funny sound. Now his mother had warned him that at night time, it is the fairy folk that are off and out, so never to go near where you see those sounds. And although Tom remembered what his mother said, he said to himself, oh no, I am a strong man. I'll just go see what's in the bushes. So he went in the bushes, and sure enough, it was a wee little leprechaun with a very long beard that was tangled up in the bush. And Tom thought to himself, ha ha ha, this is a leprechaun. If I play me cards right, I'll have his gold. So he tiptoed up and grabbed the man by the hand. Oh, said the man, let me go. Oh, no, said Tom. I know that when I that have caught myself a leprechaun, I just must keep my eyes on you, and then I will get your gold. Well, said the wee man, well, first, you, you, you must untangle me. I said, Tom, and he worked with one hand, and he untangled the man's beard from that bush. And then Tom said, now you must be showing me where your gold is. Oh, said the little man, I, I suppose that I must, but I don't want you. And as Tom looked down, he saw on the ground a little shovel, no bigger than your thumb. So he knew that the leprechaun had buried that gold somewhere in that field. I says the leprechaun, and I know it can't lie to you, so come with me. And he took him into the middle of the field to a bush. And there was a bush that was beautiful. And the leprechaun said, Behold, it's buried underneath the bush. Well, says Tom, I have a problem. I have no shuttle with me and yours. It's far too wee for me to use to try and dig up that gold. Well, said the leprechaun, why not take your scarf and tie it to the lowest branch of that bush? And then go home and get your shovel. And then when you get back, it'll be there. I says Tom, but, but in order to do that, I'll, I'll have to leave you here. I says the leprechaun, you will. But I have to give you my solemn promise that I will not untie that scarf. Oh, yes, said Tom, you must not untie the scarf and, and you must not move the gold. I says the leprechaun, I give you my solemn promise. And once the leprechaun gives a solemn promise, it must be kept. So Tom went off down the road to and he rushed as fast as he could, and he got his big shovel, and he went down the road back toward Clona Kilty, and as soon as he got to the field, he began to look for that bush with the scarf on it, and as he stepped into the field, he saw it. There was the bush with the green scarf tied to the lowest branch. Or was that the bush, for it too had a green scarf tied to the lowest branch? Or, or was that his bush? with the green scarf tied to the lowest branch. There were hundreds of bushes, and every single one had a green scarf tied to the lowest branch. Oh, no, said, uh, said Tom. That leprechaun, he has bested me after all. He did not break his promise, but he tied scarves to every single bush in the field. And now I'll never know which bush has the gold. And poor Tom, shouldered his shovel, walked sadly home, but I think he heard a sound of laughter in the distance. And it's probably that laugh. Yeah. Well, the next story I'm going to tell you is a classic Irish fairy tale. And the reason why it means so much to me is because the reason why I became a storyteller is because my dad now, my dad passed away 25 years ago. But the year after he passed away, I had the chance to take a storytelling class 
And my storytelling teacher said to me, Mrs. Rice, you need to pick stories that matter to you. And I picked stories that were all Irish stories because it really helped me connect to my dad. Because you see, my dad had lived in Ireland for four years when he was three until he was seven. Isn't that weird? He lived in a different country all by himself. His family stayed here in America. And he lived with other family members in Ireland. So when I learned all of those stories, it really brought me a lot closer to him. But I will tell you, as adults probably know, sometimes you don't always stay on good terms with everybody in your life. And there was a short period of time that my father and I just couldn't see eye to eye. I'm sure that's happened to you as well. And so when I found this story, it really opened up my heart and helped me think about my relationship with my father and how, by the end of his life, we had come back together and had become close. So this story means the world to me, and it is called Like Me, Love Salt by Jimmy Neal Smith. There once was a king, and he had three daughters, and he had gotten it into his head to go to the nearby kingdom to buy them each a gift. So he called his first daughter to him, and he said, daughter, what might I bring you from the other town? And she said, oh, father, bring me a flashing red dress that I might wear to a party. I says he, and he called his second daughter to him, and he said, daughter, what might I bring you from a nearby town? Oh, says she, bring me a dashing green dress that I might wear to a party. I says her father, and then he called his third daughter to him, and he said to her, daughter, what might I bring you? from town. Oh, says she, Father, just bring me a, a pure white dress that I might wear to please you. I says her father, and off he went to that kingdom, and while he was there, he did indeed find a, a flashing white dress and a dashing green dress and a dress of pure white. And as he was picking up those dresses, he folded them very carefully, put them in his saddlebags, and commenced to ride home. And as he was close to the palace, he saw above him an overhanging branch that would quite knock the crown off his head if he didn't do something. So he reached up and he grabbed that branch and he pulled it down. And he saw the most beautiful roses you ever did see. And the father put that branch on the saddle in front of him and he commenced on to go home. And when he got there, he called his oldest daughter to him, and he said, Daughter, how much do you love me? Oh, says she, I, I, I love you more than all the jewels in the kingdom. For well, that was what was on her mind. Well, her answer delighted her father. So he got that flashing red dress, and on it he put one of those beautiful red roses, and off she went to get ready for a party. And he called his second daughter to him. And he said, daughter, how much do you love me? Oh, says she, I love you more than all the suitors I could possibly have for you. See, that was what was on her mind. And her answer quite pleased her father. So he went and he got that dashing green dress, and on it he put one of the most beautiful white roses, and he gave it to her, and off she went to get ready for the party. And then he called his third daughter to him. Now he was most interested in the answer this girl would give, for you see, she was the child of his heart, the child he loved more than any other. And so as he called his daughter to him, he said, daughter, how much do you love me? Well, so she, I, I, I can't answer a question like that. What do you mean, said her father, how much do you love me? Well, so she, I, I can't measure it, I, I, I don't know. I, I just love you, like that means love salt. Well, her answer enraged her father, who threw that white dress on the floor, and he had his daughter locked up in a tall tower, where she stayed for many years, with only an old woman to come bring her food and water. Well, as time passed, an old woman was riding by that tall tower, and he happened to look up where the youngest daughter was 
combing her beautiful hair in the window. And he quite fell in love with her beautiful face. And he climbed up that tower, and he brought her down, and put her on his saddle, and he commenced to take her to home, where he married her. And they lived happily for a long time. Well, in the meantime, the other two sisters also had married. And after a while, the old king grew too old to rule. So he went to live with his oldest daughter, but she sold all of his precious things so that she could have the money. And he knew she did not really love him. So he left her house and he went to the home of his second daughter. But she was so enamored of her husband that she ignored her father and made him sleep on the floor by the fire with the dogs. And he knew she did not really love him. So after a while, the poor old king wandered away into the forest, and no one had ever even thought to look for him. Well, as it happened, the husbands of the two daughters declared war on the nobleman who had married the youngest daughter, and when they came to the country to fight the battle, the youngest daughter said to her husband, Husband, I have been a good wife. I have been faithful to you all these years. Why can't I just go and see where my old home was? And then after I see it, I'll come right back to you. I, I, says her, her husband. And so off she goes. And she came to the place where the castle was, where she had lived. But it was all in ruins. And her heart sore. She heard a rustling in the bushes, and from the bushes came an old man with a crown of, of briar bush around his head. And she looked and she saw it was her father, but he had quite lost his mind with grief and did not even recognize his daughter. But she lovingly took him by the hand and brought him to her husband. And once they had won the war, they took her father to their home. And there they set him up in beautiful apartments and took care of his every need. And then one night, the youngest daughter went to the cook and she said, cook, prepare the meal tonight without one grain of salt on the meat. Well, said the cook, I won't do that. to will ruin the meal. And sure enough, that cook, she made a beautiful feast, but on the meat she put not one grain of salt. And when it came time to eat, the old king took one bite, and he covered his face in grief, and he said, Oh, I once had a daughter who said she loved me like meat loves salt, and I had no idea. But that is all you can ask of anyone, just to love. And now I do not even know where she is. And the youngest daughter came forward and moved his hands away. And she said, Father. And his mind came back to him. And he recognized that precious daughter. And he sent his servant for a trunk. And in that trunk, you know, was that white dress. And as he took it out to give to his daughter, do you know where on it was that branch of white roses that were as beautiful and fragrant as the day they had been picked? And as he gave that gift to his youngest daughter, he said, Daughter, I do not understand. I have treated you terribly. How could you be so kind? Oh, says she, it was you who taught me, Father, that forgiveness is the heart of love. Okay, the next story I have for you is really special because Mr. Rice and I wrote this one together. And some of you may have heard it before, okay, but it's called The Magic Finger. And together we had listened to a slightly different story and we translated it into an Irish story. 
And then together we worked on all of the language. And so the story that I'll tell you today is called The Magic Finger. But I want all of the kids to take out a finger. Okay, and repeat after me. By the power of the fairies. By the power of the fairies. Take this stone so gray and cold. Take this stone so gray and cold. Let my finger do its magic. Do Turn this pebble into gold. Turn this pebble into gold. So when I say that part, and I'm going to say it several times throughout the story, you can certainly say it with me. Okay? Are you ready? It's called the magic finger. It was Saint Patrick Saint Martin, and the wily leprechaun Mike and Finnegan woke up and stretched himself and had no idea. It was about to be the worst day of his life. For well, you see, St. Patrick's Day is the best day for leprechauns to make gold. And do you know how they make gold? Do you know that? Well, they have to go down to a place where there's water. And then they also have to grab a rock from the water. And they must make sure that the rock is round and smooth and gray and cold. Or the magic will not work. So Michael Finnegan got himself up and dressed, and he put on his dark trousers and his little wee waistcoat and his top hat and those sitting slippers that roll up at the end, and he went on down to the river. He put his hands in the water, and he reached around, and he reached around, and he reached around until he put his hand upon a river rock. And Michael Finnegan held out that river rock, and he made sure. And it was gray, it was cold. Then Michael Finnegan took out his magic finger and he said, By the power of the fairies, take this stone so gray and cold, let my finger do its magic, turn this pebble into gold. And he worked that stone, and he worked that stone, and he worked that stone, until right before your very eyes was a beautiful nugget of gold right there in the center of his palm. Well, Michael Finnegan was going to hold up that nugget of gold to the sun right up in the morning there in order to perfect its shimmer. And he's, he's holding it up and admiring his handiwork. From the left to my hand, I've got you, it said. Oh, says he, what is your name? And the boy said, well, you see, my name is Murphy. Oh, says Michael Finnegan. All right, Murphy, well, what will you be wanting with me? Oh, says Murphy, well, you see, I caught me a leprechaun, and I know me rights. I know, I know, said Michael Finnegan. Yes, said Murphy, you owe me one wish. Yes, said Michael Finnegan, and I know just what you want. You humans, you're all alike. You'll be wanting my gold. Well, now that you say it, said Murphy, I, and he grabbed a little of gold, quick as you and was off. Poor Michael Finnegan. All that work, and nothing to show for it. So he went down the river, just a bit, underneath the branches of an overhanging tree, and he hid himself underneath, and he put his hands in the water, and he reached around, and he reached around, and he reached around until he put his hand upon a river rock. And Michael Fagan held up that, bundle, that river rock, and he made sure that it was round. It was smooth, and it was gray, and it was cold. And Michael Finnegan took out his magic finger, and he said, By the power of the fairies, take this stone so gray and cold, that my finger do its magic, turn this pebble into gold. And he worked that stone, and he worked that stone, and he worked that stone, until right before your very eyes was a beautiful nugget of gold, as round and pretty as you please. to the right, left of him. No oh, one was there. So Michael Finnegan held that nugget of gold up to the noonday sun to perfect its shimmer. And from over the right come a hand, I got you. Oh, says Michael Finnegan. Oh, what do you think you're doing? As a matter of fact, who do you think you are? Well, said the little girl, my name is Vienna. Vienna, said Michael Finnegan. I know you, I know just what you want. Said Vienna. I said Michael Finnegan, you humans, you're all alike. 
you're going to be wanting me gold. Well, said the animal, all that you say it, and she grabbed that of gold and took off down the road as quick as you please. Horrible thing. That sun was starting to set, but he knew he only had a little bit of time before he could make the gold on St. Patrick's Day. So he went all the way down, underneath the shadow of a big boulder. And when he was there, I'm a with his hands in the water. And he reached around, and he reached around, and he reached around, until he put his hand upon him. a river rock. And Michael Finnegan took out that river rock, and he made sure that it was round, and it was smooth, and it was gray, and it was cold. Michael Finnegan took out his magic finger, and he said, by the power of the fairies, take this stone so gray and cold, let my finger do its magic, turn this pebble into gold. And he works that stone, and he works that stone, and he works that stone, until right before your very eyes was the most beautiful nugget of gold Michael Finnegan had ever made in his whole little wee life. But he remembered that perfectly. And he remembered that man. So he looked to the left of him. He looked to the right of him. No one was there. So Michael Finnegan held that nugget of gold up to the dying rays of the sun and from over the top of the hand, I've got you all, said Michael Finnegan. This is not me day. What is your name? And the little boy said, Oh, my name is Danny. Well, said Michael Finnegan, what do you think you're doing? Oh, said Danny, I've caught me a leprechaun, and I know me rights. Oh, you do, said Michael Finnegan. Oh, yes, said Danny, you must give me one wish. I know, I know, said Michael Finnegan, you be Romans, you're all alike. You'll be wanting my gold, but no, said Danny. No, said Michael Finnegan. No, said Danny, I don't want your gold. And I don't want your little wee waistcoat or your little green pants or that top hat or those silly little slippers that roll up at the end. Well, said Michael Finnegan, if you don't want me gold and you don't want me clothes, what do you want? Oh, says Danny, I want your magic finger. Me magic finger, said Michael Finnegan. You can't take me magic finger. If you take me magic finger, I lose all my powers. Aye, said Danny. Well, well, if you take me magic finger, I won't be able to make any gold. Aye, says Danny. And, and if you take me magic finger, you'll be making all the gold. Aye, says Danny, but there was nothing for it. For you see, Michael Finnegan has to give his finger to Danny. So, if you ever go to Ireland and you happen to see a little wee man with only four fingers on his right hand, you'll know you've seen no one. I know I was saying it. But how do I know this? As a matter of fact, how do I even know how that becomes made gold? Well, I know this, you see. Because when Danny grew up, Danny. Married me. The end.